to episode 31 of Kowalski Analysis. I am very excited for tonight's show. I have one a very special guest, a guy named Elliot Hals. And I discovered Elliot a couple of years ago on YouTube. He's a strong man and a strength coach, a really smart guy, he has uh, philosophies about a lot of things, very well read and just a very interesting person. Uh, he's now actually a Christian too, which makes me even more excited to talk to him. So I, I can't wait to bring him in. But before I do, I just want to quickly mention my sponsor, uh, Micah Hughes, good friend of mine with Mundal Consulting. And, and Micah, what he does is he helps people um, attain financial peace through home ownership, possibly through home ownership, but also through just through real estate in general. So whether you want to buy a home, sell a home, maybe you want to invest in real estate, Micah can help you. If anyone's out there that listens to my stuff on the regular and you have you know, any desire to buy a home or, or, or even sell your home, Anytime in the near future, I would greatly appreciate you calling Micah because not only will he take good care of you, but he is a supporter of mine. And if you um, support what I'm doing, then uh, I would love for you to support the people that support me. So you can reach Micah at 443-532-8450, or you can email him and I'll put this, that email address in the show notes. The next thing I want to tell you about is CityFam Seize the Day Conference that's coming up in January of next year, 2021. And this is a, something that we do every year. It's a goal setting retreat. And we really are just trying to make sure that we're doing everything in our power to not to, and we just want to make sure that we're doing everything in our power to make sure that not only our leaders, but also our members are set up to have their best year ever. So every January, we do this over the course of a weekend where we work through these exercises together, and they really help you figure out what is it that you want most in life? What do you care about the most? And then let us help you set your life up in such a way that you can actually accomplish those things. So many people have dreams and goals that they uh, either never act on, or if they do act on, maybe they don't accomplish because they try to do too many different things or or whatever it is, but we really actually want you to do the things. So just some of the things on a personal level that I accomplished over the course of 2020 after taking this uh, retreat back in, in January of this year was I wrote another book. I went on a tour over in the UK for my, my last book. I launched an online course. I, I launched a podcast. So I've done a, quite a few things and I attribute most of the things I've been able to accomplish to these exercises that I learned by working with high performance coaches, namely Lori Lockamy, who's actually going to be leading Seize the Day. So to learn more information about our retreat, uh, in January, go to cityfam.com. You can go to the, under the events tab and you can register. If you have more questions, you can drop me a DM and I'll get back to you with more info. But without further ado, let's get into our conversation with Elliot. All right, tonight we have on the show, Elliot Hals. Elliot is an internationally renowned strength and conditioning coach, strongman, author, social media, social media celebrity, mentor, husband, father of four, and father figure to millions worldwide. He has over 2 million YouTube subscribers. People listen to what he has to say and they follow his advice because it works. He is an OG fitness YouTuber that has made his, that made his first YouTube video in 2007. In the spring of 2014, he reached 1 million subscribers on his channel. Six months later, he quit. Over the next five years, his life went downhill. He tore both biceps had hernia surgery, injured his neck in an accident, and tore his Achilles tendon in 2016. He, he lost everything. He lost strength, muscle, money, fame, friends. Some say he lost his mind, but he emerged a changed man. And tonight we're going to talk about that. Welcome to Kowalski Analysis, Elliot Hulse. Thanks for having me, Rob. Was that a good introduction? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, man, I only discovered you a couple years ago, but um, really – you know, right off the bat, I, I, I don't know. I, I, you have a lot of charisma. I'm sure you've heard that before, but I've been most intrigued by your journey lately. Just seeing your, um, you know, speak so openly a, a, about God, really. I mean, that's probably been the thing that I'm like, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. You know, I think the thing that I, I liked about your, your content that you were putting out, even back, even like the old stuff is like, is that you, you kind of just didn't give a fuck, you know, like basically of what other people thought, you know, you're really transparent. And even now, like, I, I guess I was, 
you know, I've watched, the, I watched the documentary that somebody made on you. You actually posted on your Instagram recently. I watched that the other day. And, um, the guy was talking about some of the things where you contradict it, you're, you know, you contradict yourself. And I'm like, I think the thing that I most appreciated about you is like, when you go into something, you go all in. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it, for me, I used to be the biggest club promoter and, and stripper in Baltimore. <laughs> and then I gave my life to God and I'm going, now I'm going a thousand miles an hour in that direction. So for some people, it's like, I think that they, they kind of like, don't get it, but I'm like, whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to go a thousand miles an hour. Right. And I might find out I'm wrong, you know, which yeah. I did. I found out I was wrong when I was, you know, crazy. Um, but eventually you land in the right place. And, and when you do, you take that passion to that, you know, aspect of your life. So anyway, I just want to tell you that on a personal level. Yeah, man, I agree with you. So um, how'd you get into strongman competitions in the first place? Well, I played high school and college football. I loved lifting. I was kind of a brute. I love banging heads with people and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I graduated and I started my family, started my business, um, I actually just saw an ad for a, for a strongman workshop that was happening in a city near me in Florida. And it, I just thought it seemed interesting. It was kind of like right up my alley, like in terms of like uh, brute strength. I'm not much of a finesse guy, you know? <laughs> and strongman is just pure brute. Mm -hmm. I tried martial arts and things like that. Mm -hmm. and they just, they got, it's too heady. I just want to move stuff and throw stuff and break stuff. And <laughs> so <laughs> I saw this, I was like, Hey, that looks like it's right up my alley. So I gave it a try. And, uh, the guy that put on the workshop was a Florida state chairman for, uh, North American Strongman, And he had me carrying kegs, big kegs filled with like water and sand. Heaviest one was like 300 pounds. He had us, uh, uh, dragging this tire. It was attached to a chain um he had us take the kegs and like load it onto the back of his truck so we we're like picking them up put them down and um at the end of that workout my legs were so busted that i had to lay in the middle of the the, the uh the parking lot and i couldn't i couldn't move and it was like that ache i don't know if you ever trained so hard that like it aches and you just you move around but you can't get any relief mm -hmm. and uh that's when i fell in love <laughs> i was like this is it this is what i was made to do a couple weeks later, I went to his house, which is where he used to train. He he had like, this guy, you roll up to his house, it was the craziest thing. And in his driveway, you know, he lived in a small house on Clearwater, in his driveway, there were just like eight large tires just leaning up against his garage. And he had like rows of kegs. And this is all out in front of his house. You drive by his house and you wonder like, is this a junkyard or, <laughs> or what? But anyway, the first time I went there, he, uh, He beat me up pretty bad. He had me lifting some stones, tore up all the skin on my on my uh, forearms, lifting these uh, up to a 300 pound stone onto this thing. And I was like 197 pounds back then. I lost a lot of weight after football. Uh, yeah, and I knew I was in heaven. So that, that was the story of finding straw, man. That's awesome. And you won a lot of competitions too, right? Yeah, I'm built for it. Like, you know, it's it's great when you find the thing that you are meant to do, you know, and there are a few things that like I do because I got to do it or I want to do it or uh, I'm forced to do it. But, you know, when you find that thing that like when you do it, it's like, wow, it's just easy. It just seems like, you know, wow, it's made for this. So um, I knew right away that it would I would excel. And so I was winning. I won like first place in every competition I did practically mm. came uh, back then when they had a pro card, like you could, you could win to be a pro. Mm -hmm. uh, that was like 2010. I did that. And then, um, and then I started getting injuries. So I backed off. Yeah. So why'd you stop making videos in 2014? If you don't mind me asking, cause you pretty much right at the top of your game. Then you got a million subscribers. You know, I was looking at some of your videos. It's like every one that you put out was getting tens of thousands of views. Mm -hmm. So what, what was it? You just got burnt out or? Yeah, a little bit of that. And just, you know how you said I'm very open and, you know, like yourself, you go full bore in whatever direction. I'm not really tied down by circumstances. I just do whatever I want. And right. 
<laughs> it, sometimes, sometimes it works out well. Sometimes it gets me in trouble. It's not all, you know, it's not a guarantee. Mm. You know, you tell people, do what you feel, do what you want, follow your heart. Uh, that's a, that's a gamble. It's 50, yeah. 50 you know, sometimes right. the heart's wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, so I just didn't feel like it. I just didn't want to do it anymore. I was just like, all right, I'm done. Kind of said everything I needed to say. Um, in <laughs> retrospect, I have all kinds of ideas about why that happened and um, they make sense. But at the moment, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just like, all right. I did it. I'm done. Yeah, because you're so. I mean, you're still sitting on. I mean, having a million plus uh, follower YouTube channel is a pretty incredible opportunity. When you get in that many views, that many people listening to your everything that you say, I mean, you can really, you know, come out. You know, monetize that in a variety of ways, or or not just monetize it. You can do a lot with that, and you do. You, I mean, you got different programs and mm -hmm. and you know, strength camp and all that. Um, but yeah, I was just I was just curious <clears throat> why you stopped. Um, the injuries. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that because I feel like, you know, like, so sometimes, you, you know, if you look at the person you were before you, you had the injuries and you look at the person that you are now, like, do you, do you think that the injuries played a large part in really the, the becoming the man that you are today, specifically the man of God that you are? Oh yeah. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, humbling. I'm a very prideful guy, very willful guy. Yeah. Uh, and so I needed, I need a little bit of a course correction and that's the way God was going to get me because mm -hmm. I am known for my body. You know, I yeah. lift, and I take off my shirt on camera and I perform feats of strength. And, uh, even like I said, I played college football and stuff. I was, I was just like the guy, I would just abuse my body. I would just throw my body head first into people. Um, total disregard for my body because uh, you know I'm, I'm built that way I can do that I used to like I had no compassion for people who were weak <laughs> what do you mean you can't take a hit what you, what's wrong with you I mean, right. you can't pick that up uh it, they were God's gifts you know and I had to recognize that it wasn't me it wasn't me I didn't give myself this gift or God's gifts and he had to remind me that uh he could take it away as quickly as he's given them to me and so uh, there were a few chastisements that were heading my way in order to remind me of who's in charge. Uh, yeah. It's not me. <laughs> yeah. For me, it was, um, I was very popular, you know, when I was doing running the nightlife and, you know, good with ladies and, and God just basically said, when he called me, he just took all that away, you know, let, left me working at the front desk of a gym. Nobody knew who I was anymore. Told me I was going to, you know, that he would bring me a wife if I weighed it turned into like six years of abstinence. So like everything that I, that I got value from, yeah. he just took from me and yeah. it's super humbling, man. I like TD, TD Jakes talks about, it. he calls it the crushing. I actually just read his book where like, you know, if, when, when you want wine from a grape, you have to crush that grape and God yeah. will crush us to get the wine out of us, you know? And for you, like, I'm assuming a lot of your value came from being strong, like you said, and, and even famous and everything else. So God was just like, Oh, nope, let's crush Elliot. And, uh, I <laughs> yeah. make him into the real strong man that I want him to be. Was it, was it depressing when you went through all that? Well, yeah. Confusing, you know, uh, unsettling <laughs> grounding, you know, it was a total mind shift. So everything was turned upside down. So uh, you could say depression, but I mean, that just scratches the surface. There's just a total disorientation, you know? Mm. That's what happens. You know, ultimately it's an ego dissolving. And so, you know, I'm not against the ego. The ego is our interface with the world. It's how we know ourselves and others get to interact with us. Um, but when all that crumbles, <laughs> they're, uh, it's confusing. Yeah. Yeah, man. So, um, you say, uh, we're just going to jump into some stuff now. So I've, I've been watching a lot of your stuff lately, really kind of preparing for the interview. And one of the things you talk a lot about is that there's an attack on manhood mm. right now. So can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Cause I'm sure there's going to be plenty of people that are watching this that haven't heard uh, your videos before. So I'd love for them to hear your take on all that. 
Well, you know, I'll start with this, that the Bolshevik revolution, <laughs> right? I mean, who thinks that far back? You know, I think it was uh, 1918 or something like that. Maybe even a little bit further back, you know, who wants to begin a conversation about why men are weak going all the way back to Russia? But in many ways, that's when it began. And there was an overthrow of the monarchy and there was a, uh, a social uprising in order to ultimately we'll take over uh, and destroy what was left of a, of a, of a, of a country, you know, and it was a, it was a Marxist takeover, uh, communist ultimately. And you, we know that Russia was communist for a very long time. Uh, and so the, the perpetrators, you know, Karl Marx and Stalin who wanted to, who did that, who they made, you know, they fomented and created this revolution, uh, wanted to export it West and wanted to take over the entire West. That was the whole idea. Communism is about consolidating power into the hands of a very few and making everybody else a serf. It comes oftentimes on a, uh, on a platter of, uh, of prettiness. You know, they, they, they make it seem like everything's going to be great. It's a utopia. It's man-made utopia, right? That's the whole thing with communism. It's we're going to make heaven on earth. That's the whole idea. Never works, has never worked, mm -hmm. and has created millions and millions and millions of lost lives but it wasn't working. They couldn't export it, especially to America. And they knew that if they were going to destroy the West, they're going to take over the West. They're going to get this ultimately the ultimate demise. The ultimate prize is a one world order, one world communist order, world order, which we're getting there now. And you'll see mm -hmm. why this all relates to why men are under attack. Um, Antonio Gramsci, who was one of the founders, one of the, uh, well, let me go back a little bit further. They realized that it wasn't working because there was a growing middle class in America. They couldn't, they couldn't, there was no, there would be no workers revolution. There would be no revolt against the, uh, the proletariat or the proletariat wouldn't rise up. Uh, and because of that, they had, to, they realized because there was a middle class that there wouldn't be a, they couldn't create, they couldn't foment social, um, social upheaval. They couldn't do it that way through economic means, hmm. right? And so uh, these, the, the, because it wouldn't work, Antonio Gramsci and Mark Lucas uh, just realized that it had to be a moral destruction of the West. You weren't gonna, you weren't gonna beat them by creating the type, same type of, you weren't gonna do it with bombs and bullets. You had, to, you had to foment moral decay. You had to destroy the culture. That's why they call it cultural Marxism. Cultural Marxism has won the West. Cultural Marxism has destroyed the West. And the, and the key point to cultural Marxism, he said, that was you need to de-Christianize the West. De-Christianizing the West begins with two things, both of which are fathers. Get the fathers out of the home and get the fathers out of their home. So you have to destroy God and you got to destroy the family. That, is, that was... That was the main weapon of choice. So if you're gonna if you're gonna take down the West, you've got to destroy hmm. the relationship <clears throat> with God. You had to you had to dechristianize it. There couldn't be any God because communism can't work if there is a if there's a divine God. There has to be a government God. You have to hmm. so you have to. That's why we have atheism to such a great degree here now. Uh, and you had to destroy the families. And they did that. They did all this through psychological warfare they own the cultural marxists the marxists made their way into media you know all media left it's left leaning it's all owned by uh, i don't even go down that route but you know where i'm going right you yeah, know the sure, whole sure. rainbow coalition yeah and uh and same thing with the universities universities are all on they also infiltrated the church they knew they had to take down specifically the catholic church so they were they uh, infiltrated by with having a whole a bunch of homosexuals get into the seminaries. This was uh, Belladad, and this was where uh, 
stated objective was to put a bunch of homosexuals into the um into to, to ultimately be in the hierarchy of the catholic church so they can have the scandal that we have today and you destroy the moral fabric of uh the church um <laughs> i mean and then you can you can come right into where we're at today with the chemical castration of men. So, I mean, we've been morally degraded. The, cold, the entire culture is against fathers. And what, what this ultimately looks, looks like in terms of the, uh, the culture, degra the, the destruction of the father is feminism, uh, creating a situation where families could be easily picked apart, destroyed. 70% yeah. uh, of marriages end in divorce right now. 90% of them are initiated by women. Mm. Uh, part of the way they would do this is by promoting um, promiscuity, birth control pills, abortion, sexual revolution. Yeah, this is how you destroy the family. And so we got that. And then, like I was saying before, you know, we got the pollution. We've got plastics, xenoestrogens, phytoestrogens. They're literally now attacking us at the at the cellular level. Men are actually literally becoming women. Their testosterone levels have dropped in precipitously over the past. Uh, 40 years, we've got about half the amount of testosterone that our, that our dads or granddads did. So uh, they're winning. It's, it's, we're losing this battle. Right. <laughs> you doing any, um, you're 40, you're 40, what? 40 plus, right? 41. Mm -hmm. 41. Or do you do any uh, testosterone therapy? No, I'm not taking any testosterone. No, I, I mean, just. I'm not I, against I'm, it. Yeah, I did the pellets once. I did the pellets once at a life extension Institute. It made me, the thing is, is I'm single and it made me really horny. And I just didn't want to feel that way. <laughs> like, honestly, I agree with everything you said. I grew up in a fatherless home. Um, and I got into a lot of shit that I probably wouldn't have got into if my dad was in the house, because I would have been scared of getting spanked or, or maybe he would have taught me some things that, you know, my mom didn't teach me. She was busy working, trying to provide, put food on the table. You know, my dad didn't pay child support. So like, I, I get it. I totally get the father thing. Like I wrote a book called why waiting works, which is all about the, the practicality of saving sex for marriage. Because, um, you know, when I became a Christian, God told me he had somebody for me. So I, I went from being very promiscuous to abstinent for six years straight. And I really, from living at the polar ends of the spectrum, I started to understand it because I didn't understand it when I started, I was like, why is this wrong? It's two people making each other feel good kind of thing. Right. But when I, when I stopped, I realized this is why all my relationships haven't worked, why I kept falling for the wrong women, mm -hmm. you know, like how, even though I was in a bad relationship and then we'd break up, it would pull us back in. There was like a soul tie, all <laughs> these different things I understood. So I, I really get it. And, um, and it's right, you know, as, as hard as it is to do it, it's, it's a hundred percent right. I actually read a quote of yours where you talked about, you met your wife when you were really young, like 15, I think you said. Mm -hmm. and how that um you know the fact that you guys have been together and you didn't have that many sex partners how that really contributed to you being able to have a like a long and successful marriage you basically said that right uh which part just i think i don't remember the quote actually i think I'm, i may have it i may have it you said that i'm convinced that early exclusivity and minimal sex partners has contributed oh. a large part to the success of our relationship yeah Right. And, you know, that was by the grace of God completely. I didn't, we didn't know what we were doing. We got addicted to each other sexually. And it just turned out that that's it. We're pinned together and we're good together and it's going to last. That's awesome. Um, I, that wasn't a conscious decision. That wasn't yeah. something like, you know, either of us had any clue. We were just kids uh, having a good time with each other. And, yeah. uh, but, you know, now four kids and 24 years later. <laughs> Yeah. You, you, you got lucky, you know, because you, right. you know, you met her, you met her early on, but there, there's a lot of things that, you know, related to uh, promiscuity specifically that people don't understand. Like right. uh, there's a correlation between number of sex partners and divorce rates being higher specifically yeah. with women. It's when you have more than 10 sex partners, you, you, they actually have the highest divorce rate. So there's truth in everything that you're saying. Um, which is, you know, again, why I think if, if you do wait um, to have sex, you, you say your best yes to that person. And then the, the chances of you being divorced and being in a, a home without a father or a single parent home becomes a lot lower. Right. 
So like you had mentioned that the divorce rate, 70%, that's actually the first time I heard that. I thought it was like 50%. So I didn't know that it had gone up. Oh yeah. So, um, I watched the video of yours too, where you were talking, this is an older video where you talked about sex transmutation. <laughs> it was awesome. Actually. I liked it a lot. Um, <laughs> I write about it in the book. I read thinking oh, Girl cool. Rich years ago. Yeah. And, I, and for me, it's definitely been something that I've attributed a lot of my success to. I've written a couple books and started mm -hmm. a nonprofit and I, I wouldn't have done any of that if I was, um, if I was sexually active, specifically not with, you know, one person, if I was out chasing different girls or whatever, it would never happen. Um, but I like how you explained it, you know, where it was like, basically like, you know, you, <laughs> you said you're giving all your energy to your craft. Basically you're like, you know, when you make your videos, you're fucking the world. You said in the video, I don't know if you've listened <laughs> to this one in a while, but it was, it was pretty, it was pretty funny and it made a lot of sense. Even the way you said you stand when you're making your videos, leaning into the camera and, you know, um, do you still believe all that to say about sex transmutation? Cause oh yeah. I mean, it's, that's science. You know, it's, it's true, man. If we're out there busting our nuts and jizzing all over the place, we lack a tremendous amount of vitality. You yeah. know, uh, we even live, we don't live as long either. You know, I, I, I make a joke with my wife that every time we have sex, I, she took one more day away from me. <laughs> so, I actually pre-recorded a uh, an episode. I'm going to air it right after this one with a guy named Dave Asprey. Mm -hmm. uh, who do you know? Who he is. Yes. Okay. So I had Dave on the show, and he was talking about it's like a Eastern Eastern philosophy where you take your age, you you subtract seven from it, then you divide it by four. So for you, forty one minus seven, thirty four divided by four, you'd be at about eight and a half so you shouldn't ejaculate more than more than once every eight and a half days if you want a long life mm -hmm. so i said to him i was like so hold on wait a second i gotta ejaculate less and live longer i was like that doesn't sound like a good proposition <laughs> but no man it's true like yeah you you really do you you don't live as long if the more if you ejaculate too often which was kind of i actually never even heard that but that i thought was kind of eye-opening mm -hmm. yeah so um I wanted to talk to you a little bit about like um, trust in your heart. That was one thing that you used to talk a lot about when you were, when you were younger. And then lately, um, you know, you kind of gone back on that where you're like, don't trust your heart. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, I think what I really mean to say is don't be so quick to jump to emotional conclusions. And I think in our world where we put uh, a tremendous amount of value on feelings, almost too much value. Mm -hmm. And it's strange because, you know, we're, I think we're still in a, in a, in a paradigm where we're, we're, we're in the, under this belief that men need to feel more, right? Like somehow men are oppressed because we don't cry all the time. <laughs> we're not designed that way. We're not like women, but because the world is diabolically disoriented and men are women and women are men. You know, a lot of this has been pushed on us. Cry more, man. Feel more, man. And uh, and we've we've crossed the threshold. We're, we're we we're, we fell off the cliff with our addiction to sensuality, to sensual novelty, to feelings, even sex. Sex is a, is addiction to emotion. You know, that's a that's energy moving in the body. It's emotion. It, it's feelings, right? That's why you have sex for the feelings. Why do people get addicted to ice cream for the feelings? Why do people get addicted to all kinds of things? All the, all the addictions uh, we have, even the, even the addiction to the, uh, to the, to the iPhone, you know, scrolling and getting that dopamine hit. It's all related to our over indulgence in material, uh, material gratification. Yeah. <clears throat> all of it. And so, when I speak, I speak in absolutes. That's just the way I am. I'm an extremist, right? And so when I said, follow your heart, I was talking literally like, whatever you feel, just do it. Let's go, <laughs> run with it, right? Because that's how I lived my life. And I had a lot of success as a result because that's just been my path. Yeah. Um, but, th but then I grew up and I, and I realized that uh, I've made a lot of mistakes. And not only that, when I look at the young men that I mentor and I realize these men are overly identified with what they're feeling way too overly identified with the things that they feel rather than being a bit detached, holy detachment, just stepping back sometimes, feeling the feelings, 
feel the feelings, but don't get caught. In, here's what really happens oftentimes. They get caught into a mood. Mm-hmm. So it's not just the feeling. It's the attachment to the feeling. It's the feeling that comes up. You can't help feelings. Feelings are going to come up. Right. But it is, it's the mental masturbation over the feelings. Well, why is this? And what happened? And what should I do? And to whose fault it is? And how long is this going to last? And blah, 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 blah. and then next thing you know, they're stuck into, they're stuck in a mood. Right. Uh, this is totally unresourceful and effeminate. Yeah. And so when I speak to men today, that's why, like, I like guess I speak, I speak in opposites. It's better first to draw that line. Boom. Recognize that it, be objective about what you're feeling. Don't engage with it. Don't engage with your feelings. See them, recognize them, honor them, but do not attach to them and allow them to take you for a ride because you'll end up crashing into all kinds of things. Yeah, no doubt, dude. The Bible says the heart's deceitful above all things. So it'll little literally will trick you into believing things that aren't true. <laughs> so you give your flesh what it wants. And that's why that's one of the things I talk about in the book, even with you know the waiting, why waiting works is because as bad as I want. So like I say to people, okay, look, sex before marriage. I get it. Sounds extreme. What if I say no sex before love? Most people go, yeah, yeah, I can understand that. So I say, okay, well, how do you know if you're in love? <laughs> right. Well, then you'll, you'll get married to the person, right? Because you'll prove now that's when you test your heart to see if it's telling you the truth. Cause you're, you're right. Your heart will lead you into all kinds of things. You know, like back in the day when I was crazy, I used to say, if it feels good, do it, deal with the consequences right. later. Right. And then I would, I would always, <laughs> there would be lots of consequences. And after a while, you're like, you know what, man, it really is about discipline and delayed gratification. Right. Feelings aren't facts. You know, feelings are going to, like you said, I, I, my, I could feel one way and 20 minutes later, I could feel a completely different way. So right. if I was to trust my heart in that moment, like you said, I, I, I could have got myself into some big old mess when the feeling was going to change 20 minutes later. So you really kind of have to live by like principles. Right. Yeah. Which is, I think what you were really saying when you're like, even when you're like, look, the only thing, the only thing you can trust is, is God. You got to trust because it's eternal. He see, you know, he sees it from every different angle and, you know, it's principle based living for the most part, you know, like, so I, I think even with, even in that documentary, when they were like trying to criticize you for, you know, saying, I, I totally understood what you meant when you said, you know, like you can't always trust your heart, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the heart is wounded. <laughs> you know, that's where, that's the seat of our traumas in attachment theory. They talk about the polyvagal nerve, you know, that, re- that reaches from the frontal cortex down into the heart. It's a, it's a nerve that attaches what you see and what you experience in the face and in the head, uh, in your heart. And they say, you know, in attachment theory that the, the, your mother's countenance, your mother's woundedness, as she's looking at you, you know, imagine she's looking at her baby. The look in your mother's face imprints itself on your heart, on the, on the child's heart. This is science. Mm-hmm. That there's a sort of a transfer of your mother's spirit into the heart of the child. And a lot of times we're having certain feelings that are not even our own. They come from generational generational issues maybe your, your mother may have been uh some sort of distant maybe she was angry maybe she had you know all kinds of problems that show up on a, you know the that the heart recognizes when peering at the mother's face in the child so the child you know grows up being skittish and afraid and, and you know uh, has a has a tender heart and you wonder why you know why 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 not why why is it not a good idea to trust that skittish heart well, for one, it was given to you, it was implanted on you, it was printed on you uh, by this generational curse from your mother. <laughs> you definitely don't want to be following that. Right. Yeah, the word says guard your heart. Out of it flows, I think, the wellsprings of life it talks about. So if your heart is damaged, you know, experience some kind of trauma, everything's flowing out of this broken place, you know, which is, I think, even for myself, like the reason why I made a lot of the mistakes I made when I was young was because I was trying to validate myself or, you know, right. something to do with my father not being around or whatever. So that, no, that's good. Um, how do you, how do you, so you talk about like, you know, trusting God, listening to God. How do you hear from God personally? Do you, is it just 
you know, straight what you read? Or do you like, I'm, some people hear the audible voice of God. How does he lead you specifically to make decisions? Well, I'll tell you this. <laughs> Before I can answer that question, I could say that I've been led around by demons quite a bit. <laughs> and that comes in the form of trusting my thoughts, trusting my feelings, going on the whim. Uh, and like I say, there have been some wins and there have been some losses. I'm a man of action. And when something arises, I go. When, it's, when I feel something, I do it. I say it. You know, you mentioned it before that I wear, I speak openly about things. You know, you, I'm speaking openly about God. Well, that's just because God's on my heart. I speak op openly about whatever's on my heart. I have no filter. You know, it's just whatever I'm into. And, I, and so that's just been my nature. And in my maturity, I've discovered that God speaks to me when I stop. <laughs> When I stop taking so much action, when I stop thinking so much, when I stop trusting my feelings, when I just allow myself to be mm. stillness, be still and know that I am. As I allow myself to be still, I can watch, I can be a watcher. I can allow God to reveal himself to me, usually in very plain ways. I don't get any audible information from God. Uh, I try and I don't trust my feelings. So I don't know if they're, if it's God prompting me or it's my own fallen nature or it's uh, trauma, demons. I wait. This is just very hard for me. This is something that I've learned. This is something that didn't come naturally to me. I wait and I allow God to reveal himself to me. Right now I'm in the midst of trying to decide on various projects to, to do. Now, 10 years ago, I would have started hammering away, hammering away at all the projects, trying to make them all happen, forcing them to get done, doing them quickly. Now I just write it down and then I just visit it every once in a while. I'll go and I'll look at them. Hmm, okay, they're in there. Then I'll go, I pray every morning. I go to mass every morning. I pray, Lord, reveal it to me. Allow it to, if it's of you, let it be shown. If not, let it pass away. And then I wait. And if I get this, like last night, it started to happen. I caught myself. I started to get anxious about like, oh, I need, let me get on this one thing and let me start doing it. And I know now from experience that, okay, when I start doing that and it feels like I'm forcing it, I feel tension. I, you know, I can tell right away. I'm not breathing and I'm, I'm trying to go too quickly. And I'm like, wait a second, I'm not being led now. I'm trying to make it happen. So I stop completely. I stop. I'm not going to go back to it until God shows me, hey, here's, here's what's next for you. Here's the next step. You know, uh, I think uh, David, King David, writer of the Psalms, says something to the effect in one of his Psalms. You know, I don't remember all of them. I'm not a Bible memorizer. Uh, but there's something where it's at some point in one of his Psalms where he says, be a light unto my feet, be a light unto my feet. And that's kind of that's kind of way it works for me. I don't. I'm not, a light onto my feet doesn't necessarily mean light up my path. Doesn't mean the world and let me see everything. It's just show me what the next step is. Where do I got to place this next foot? Where do I put my foot next? And I allow that to be God's revelation in my life. God, I don't. I don't need. I. And in the past, I always wanted to see the future. I hired psychics. <laughs> I used to be into astrology. I wanted to know what's coming, what's coming out of fear, uh, out of anticipation. I just wanted to see, I wanted to make the future happen. These days I just, Lord, just be a light onto my feet. Just show me the next step. Where do I go next? What do I do? Next? And if it's nothing, and sometimes it's nothing, then I just stop. I just allow myself to be and realize that just because I'm not taking action, just because I'm not doing something, just because I'm not feeling something, just because I'm not thinking something, doesn't mean that there aren't amazing things unfolding in the heavenlies. There's oh. a spiritual battle going on daily. Yeah. And so I allow that battle to unfold and let God speak to me when he's ready. Yeah, man. I think there's a verse that says, be still and know that I am God. I was thinking about that when you were talking. Um, but I think like, probably one of the hardest things to do for a, a guy I know like myself, but it sounds like a guy like you is to wait, to wait on God because <laughs> it really is. It's almost like Frogger, you know, like, I don't know if you ever played Frogger when you were a kid mm -hmm. where you're like, man, I want to cross the road. 
and you think that if you just go 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 like and then bam a car comes by and splats mm -hmm. you right like sometimes god's like no way go left oh wait a second i want to go for what go left and then, and then you got to like you know it, it feels like frogger like it's just like sometimes you're sitting there and you're like god i really want to move forward in this area but nothing doesn't seem like anything's going on I, I think the thing is is that's where your faith really grows because you have mm -hmm. to just sit there and just trust that like he's working it out you know mm -hmm. but yeah. i think i think what you said about like quiet time it's so key man like to get there and just get to a place for me every day i start my day i just get my coffee i sit at my window and i just sit there and i talk to him and i listen i write things down i just think you know but i, I don't know that you can hear from him any other way because like i mean i'm sure he could cut through if he wanted to but it's like when everybody's so like busy and they're like, they pull out their phone and turn on their, you know, looking at their notifications right away. And it's mm -hmm. like, you ain't even got time to hear from God. Right. Yeah. So, um, let's get into, uh, I, I wanted to title this episode, uh, becoming the strongest version of yourself. I mean, mm -hmm. I know that's something that you talk a lot about probably mm -hmm. overdone with, with podcast interviews, but, um, what, why is it important to become strong? Well, you know, we were talking before about the attack on men, the attack on masculinity, destroying, you know, destroying masculinity is about cutting off the head of the family, right? If you want to destroy a beast, what do you do? You cut off the head. And so there, like I said before, there's a, there's a psyop and part of the psychological operation, you know, the subversion, this is what Yuri Bezmenov calls it. There's a ideological subversion is to pervert the genders. <laughs> and so why is it, I, I'll answer it this way. Why is it important for men to be strong? Well, in a world where little boys are being dressed up in dresses by their single mommies <laughs> uh, and told that they can be princesses and uh, they're allowed to cut off their penises at, you know, four, six years old and, and, and have their hormones changed so that they can be girls. We need as much force on the other side of that scale. Uh, you know, they, they, they've done a, a tremendous job of convincing us that all masculine virtue is toxic. Uh, and I'm on a mission to make men toxic again, if that's what it is <laughs> to be right. Yeah. To be strong because we have to balance the scale. It's gotten so wacky and so weird that men, not only are men weak, but men are becoming women literally yeah. cut off yeah. your penis, change your hormones. So what are the, what sets us apart from women? Well, there are a number of things that set us apart from women. And if you want to look at it, just pure physiologically, there's things that, a male body is designed to do that only a male body can do. It's made to do, it's designed to do that a woman's body can't do and vice versa, right? It's very obvious. We will never have the gift of being able to give birth. It's just, it's not in our realm. But we were given big, strong, thick, powerful bodies. That's what sets us apart. Of course, you know, it's, it's uh, politically correct, or, you know, there's this big push to make women strong, but women aren't strong. They're not supposed to be strong. That's not their deal. Their deal is not strength. Men's deal is strength. And you can argue all you want, but look at nature. Who yeah. gets the testosterone? Who gets the big bones? Who gets the big muscles? Right. Who's taller? Who's thicker? Who's heavier? Yeah. We are. Who's stronger? Us exercise that gift recognize and use it i say that a man is the, a man that is weak is as good as a woman who doesn't make babies <laughs> you're just not fulfilling your your thing here yeah how's that go over <laughs> right <laughs> i mean did you hear about that uh i want to say it was a it was a it was a mixed martial artist. I don't know I don't know if they were actually a UFC fighter but it was a it was a somebody that used to be a man that was either, I don't know if they had the operation or they just identified as a woman and she was going in there and she was beating the shit out of the other girls <laughs> or he was beating the shit out of the girls. And I'm yeah. like, 
who let this guy in? I mean, this is ridiculous. It's that we, yeah, that we've gotten Feminist to this point. It, it, it's insane, dude. It, yeah. It's 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 really weird. It, it's uh, you know a sign of the times where you know I'm, I'm a firm believer that Jesus is coming back in our lifetime, <laughs> and I just don't think it could get much weirder. You know, out there. They say it's worse than the days of Noah. Yeah, I would imagine it probably is. Like I don't know that they were. They had 50 different genders or whatever it is back then. Yeah. And like, <laughs> anyway, so how do we become the strongest version of ourselves? Like, I know you probably got a lot of, a lot of tips for that, but can you boil it down to a few of the most important things to do? Man, I'll tell you where I'm at these days. One of the things we got to consider and that it, in our culture, it is relegated to outside, outside our, the realm of our consciousness facing your death. Hmm. I don't I don't see any way to be who we're meant to be if we don't realize that our time here is limited. I think we got to recognize that we have just a blip on the map in flesh yeah. in this 3D world before we go we get to meet our maker. And to be the strongest version of yourself today that sounds to me like saving your soul. It's salvation. Mm -hmm. It's recognizing that I am fallen and I've veered so far off the path of what my creator meant for me. You know, I said before that if you're, you know, a thing that doesn't fulfill its purpose is a sinful thing. Mm -hmm. A hammer that can't put a nail, can't drive a nail through a, a, a board because it's too soft is a useless hammer, right? Uh, and that is that's the way it is with everything, you know. Um, a, 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 a nice looking iPhone, right? A nice little iPhone that doesn't turn on. Well, it's there. It's the form of the thing. It looks like the thing, but it's not the thing because it's not fulfilling the thing's purpose. Mm -hmm. And so, I think. You know, going going from the opposite in terms of you know being the strongest version of self, but what does the weak version of ourselves look like? Is strain 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 off the path of what the Creator made us for, and that is to know and to love Him. Mm. You know, uh, seek first His kingdom, and all things will be added to you. But in this world where we focus on adding things to ourselves, you know. Uh, getting things, chasing things, being addicted to things, wanting things. It's all things. Thing, 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 thing. How much thing can I get? How much stuff can I get? Right. Uh, it allows, it, it throws us off our path. It throws us off our, our ability to be what we're designed to be. And, uh, and in this short period of time that we have here, <laughs> if we don't, if we don't line up, we don't recognize that, we're way off path and we could be more, we should be more. Uh, then we get to face the judgment. Everything is just, you know, this is not something people like to talk about too much anymore. They don't talk about it in the church. They don't like to talk about the judgment, heaven and hell. Nobody wants to talk about that. That's, a, that's, a, they relegate death off to the, you know, there was a time when if somebody died in your family, they would die right in the, they would die right there in the living room. They put them on the bed and that's it. You know, everybody come and pass by the bed and they'll bury them in the backyard. It was front and center. So they recognize that, wow, this death is, death is imminent. Death is near. Death is always present. Uh, and they spent more time thinking about what happens thereafter. Right. And if God, God is just and God is always just, everything balances itself out in this world and metaphysically. Everything balances itself out, always. It just balances itself out. He's gonna balance himself out. There's got to be a judgment. There's no other way about it. Were, did you, did, were you a hammer that was soft? Were you a fruit, were you a tree that bared no fruit? Well, then you're fit for the fire, right? A, 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 a tree that bears no fruit is fit for the fire. Where, what good are you? Right? Yeah. So you're gonna face the judgment. And I think that judgment, and I, I'm reading this book right now. It's called uh, Warning. Um, uh, Testimonies on the Illumination of Consciousness. And this is, there's a belief, there's this belief that Jesus is gonna come with a warning pretty soon here. 
Oh yeah. He's gonna give us all a chance. He's going <clears> to, <throat> there's going to be a flash in the sky. People are going to say, you know, it was a solar flare or whatever, but something's going to transform within the consciousness of, of every human being on the planet. And we're going to be able to see the illumination of our consciousness. We're going to be able to see, this is, a, this is like a, a grace from God before we die that may happen in our lifetime. There are those that believe it will happen. Yeah. But we get to see all of our sins. Like just that, you know, they say that your life flashes before your eyes. We get, I, I kind of had that happen about a year ago for me and that's what turned me around. But we'll all get it. Boom, we'll get to see every single sin that we did from the time we were a kid. And got, ultimately God is saying, hey, you're being a tree that bears no fruit. Look at you, you, you bear, you, you, you're, uh, you're bearing bad fruit. Rotten fruit. Look at yeah. you. Yeah. And that'll be an opportunity like that of the last judgment, but where we may be able to stay here in the flesh and, and repent and turn around and, and do the right thing. So being the strongest version of yourself is, is a very different thing to me before. It used to be narcissistic. I'm a, I'm the greatest narcissist you can find. So I understand what that's about. You know, look good, feel good, be sexy, make money, all that. That's cool stuff. But all of that is dust. All that is just going to burn away. And in, in our pursuit of those things, we end up being soft hammers that can't drive nails. And God's going to point it out. He's going to show it to you. He's going to say, look, all that time you chased in, chasing tail uh, or, or, you know, all the, all the other things that the world uh, seduces us with, you missed the boat, buddy. You're useless, fit for the fire. And you're going to burn up. Your soul is going to burn in eternity. What a shame. Dude, that's, I mean, it's weird that we're talking about this. I was actually talking to a girlfriend of mine this morning about, so for me, 20 years ago, what happened is I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. So I didn't even know what it was. I was in Cancun, Mexico. I was with a group of friends. I was partying like a rock star the night before. I woke up the next day. I had this road to Damascus experience. I didn't even know what the road to Damascus was at the time. But I, <laughs> just like Paul encountered Christ, I, he he called me and he said, trust me, follow me. I have a plan for you. I heard it as sure as I'm talking to you right now. I did this radical 180, you know, and my life's been, it's just been a crazy journey the last 20 years. Not easy. It was like being red pilled, uh, you know, literally kind of like the matrix almost. Um, but I believed ever since then that what happened to me was, it was like God flicked the lights on and all of a sudden I became very aware of his presence. I was, I was telling a friend of mine, earlier today, it was like, it was like, imagine if you drove down this road, this highway, and you you sped down at 100 miles an hour, because you didn't think that anybody there was ever any cops on it. And then all of a sudden, you realized there were cops all over it, they were taking radar all along. <laughs> That's what it was like. I was like, Oh, shit. Like, I was aware, very aware of God's presence, and how sinful I was. Right. And I, I changed. Now, the same thing happened to a friend of mine, about seven weeks after it happened to me, he said he wanted to change. But then he never changed. He just continued. And he said, ah, he just blew, he wrote it off. He's like, you can find meaning in anything you look for. That's what he said to me. So I've been a firm believer ever since that happened. Cause I look at Peter in the day of Pentecost, when he got up, he says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams, all this stuff. Some will be turned to darkness, moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. But he says that everyone in the world is going to have something like what you just said happen to them before the end, because they're going to be given a chance to either change your ways or don't believe it. And then take the mark of the beast that's going to be coming out at some point in our, I believe, in our lifetime. And they're going to fall for this strong delusion that Second Thessalonians talks about. And they're going to take the mark and they're not going to change. Right. And then they're going to be the ones that will be thrown into the fire. Like you mentioned, it's just weird that we're talking about this. Cause I literally had this conversation this morning. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> it's amazing. It's amazing. And I'm sure previous generations believed it was their time too, when this was coming, but like we, we have the technology, we have, they have the opportunity. We have everything lined up. It's not like it's futuristic. Right. anymore right you know market yeah. and stuff like that it's like no they, it they patented you know I, I believe that uh one of the proposed vaccinations or ultimately what would want to be used in order to proceed with this marking is called luciferase have you heard of luciferase no. luciferase is the mark and the reason why they call it luciferase right is because it's, it it will be 
invisible, but under a light. You'll have to go under a light for it to be seen. And its patent number, you can look it up, is 060606. Luciferase, and they're gonna mark us all with this. This in the the, the Luciferian uh, satanic agenda is so out in the open. It's not like hidden anymore, or it's not like conspiracy theory. It's not like uh, you know you have to dig deep. It's all in plain sight. Their plans are in plain sight. You know the the World Economic Forum and the New World Order and. The, the new normal and build back better and all these terms that they're using now and they're using COVID as a means to unleash and un, un, unveil, you know, the vaccines and all that stuff. Yeah. It's got to be here. <laughs> it's right. we're, we're there. And, and there's going to be a great persecution because there's going to be a lot of people that, that don't. They're going to say, nope, I ain't doing it. Yeah, no, you're right. We are. We are right there. I mean, everything's in place. You know, even when you look at like, I, I love for my friends that don't know God or they don't believe the Bible, they'll, they'll, they'll try to discredit it. And I'm like, just some of the things that it said, you got to remember, this is 2000 years ago. And it talks about how there's going to be this mark that people have, and they won't be able to buy or sell right. or, or, or basically how the eye, you know, the two witnesses, it talks about they're killed and it says everyone in the world sees them. How, how in the hell would 2000 years ago, a person that wrote that e ever even been able to conceive that a technology like that would be available one day that everyone in the world will be able to see one specific place on earth. Like there's no way that they could have predicted that. So it has to be, I mean, I know it's true from experience, but f from their perspective, they have to recognize that it has to be true, you know, yeah. but I think what you said about like being, you know, becoming the strongest version of yourself and being useless is like, you know, when you come into the world, you come in as a baby, you're little, you, you don't, you're not even conscious of what's going on. And you kind of gradually come into the world till you reach adulthood. And then you have this period of adulthood, you know, you got some time, you got some talents that your things you're good at. You got some treasure, maybe you got a little money and that's where God's testing you. That's where he's like, okay, let's see what you do in this period here. Because at some point you start to decline, just like you, you got came into the world gradually, you start to leave gradually. Next thing you know, you die. A lot of people don't find it till they get here. They start realizing they're dying. They're like, oh shit, <laughs> let me give all my stuff away. Let me give some money to the church. Cause I'm not, you know, and then, and, and like, bro, it's too late. You wasted this period. This is your period right now. You're going through it. You got your time, your talent, your treasure, your, you know, make the most of it because it's not always going to be here. And this is going to determine so much later, you know, where we, you know, where and how we spend attorneys will be determined now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What well, a lot of people don't even believe in et the eternity. They, they believe that we're just a meat suit with hair and balls. And when we die, we turn to turn to dust. They, there is no consideration for a spiritual reality. Mm. So <laughs> there's going to be a, there's going to be a rude awakening. Yeah, for sure. What are you excited about? What are you working on? Just doing what's in front of me, man. You know, I don't get excited. I don't get excited anymore. <laughs> it's fruitless. It's silly. I don't need to be excited. I need to do my job. I need to do what's in front of me. I need to follow God's uh, ordain in my life. Mm -hmm. And so do what I got to do in order to, to, to produce fruit. And so, like I said, I'm at a crossroads right now with various different projects. Uh, I could go, I'm really, I, could, I literally, I could go in one of two or multiple different directions. And I just don't know which one. I don't know which one. And, I'm, and here's the thing, if I was an excitable guy and I allowed myself to get excited, I would start running down one of the roads. And uh, that's not what I want to do. So I'm really in a, I'm in a period of, of waiting. I'm in a period of watching. And I'm ready to move when the Lord shines that light. Yeah, that's awesome. You still got your programs. You still got the King program going, mm -hmm. right? I think I saw you advertise that recently. Yeah. Um, any, any books in the pipeline? Or is that one of the things? That's one Maybe? of the things. Yeah, that's one of the things. You know, do I? Yeah, that's, <laughs> I'm not you, sure. It might be. What would it be about if you wrote this book? You know, that's a great question because what it's about is a lot of things that I've come up with a lot of different ideas. But I think what it's about is probably less important than how it's written. 
And so I've been working on that, you know, working through that a bit. I am a improv guy. I do best without planning. That's why my videos were so popular because I'm spontaneous. I just turn it on and run. And so, you know, part of me feels that that would be the most authentic to, thing to do is just start putting pen to paper and it would just be essays. That's, you know, that's what I've been thinking about lately. Like just start writing. I, I don't know what it's gonna be about. It's almost like allowing it to be revealed. Like God, just reveal yourself through me and this pen. And whatever, whatever comes out, that'll just be what it is. I'll stamp, stamp it and ship it out. I'm like, here it is. <laughs> whatever it is, here it is. Did you self-publish your previous books? Mm-hmm. Did you? So yeah. you know about that whole process, yeah. I would imagine with your platform, you could probably get a deal, you know, a publishing deal just to get the mm -hmm. distribution. Well, no, I'm not sure everybody's going to want to give me a deal on a book about nothing. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know yet. Yeah, yeah you know, right. I, I think you're interesting though. I mean, I think a lot of people are interested in what you have to say. And I could see, I could see you get in a publishing deal. Where did you learn all your stuff, man? Because you know, your videos are as much about philosophy as they are about, you know, strength training. Would you say so? I'm a seeker. I'm a seeker. I'm curious. I've always been curious. I've been most curious about me. I grew up in uh, a suburb of New York City uh, where there were Italian kids, Irish kids, Haitian kids, Jamaican kids, Puerto Rican kids, and everybody kind of knew what they were except me. Um, my parents are from Belize, and it was a country that my teacher, when I was in third grade, and said, well, my parents are from Belize. She said, there's no such thing. <laughs> All right. And, uh, and I look Puerto Rican. I don't speak Spanish, and um, a little bit of white and a little bit of black. And so I would always get the question, well, Elliot, what are you? What are you? What are you? And that had an impression on me. And so I literally grew up asking myself, well, what am I? What am I? And I got into philosophy very, that's why I was attracted to religion. I've always been attracted to religion. I've come back and forth with Christianity, but I've dabbled with lots of other religions too. Because I'm always looking, I'm always trying to figure out who am I? What am I? And so philosophy, religion, all that stuff. Um, I spent a lot of time seeking. And so I got a lot of insights. Why did you come back to Christianity? What was it that drew, drew you back? Well, first of all, I tried a lot of other things, <laughs> right? So I knew what was out there and it all fell short. None of it was, none of it was worth pursuing too far. And I, I pursued some of them to, to, a, to a degree and then realized like, what, the, what am I doing? This is silly. Um, and it wasn't even me that, well, let me, let me, let me, um, let me refresh my memory. Um, I, I actually started fasting. I started fasting. I was like, you know, in my, in my seeking and uh, journey, uh, I just, I believe God had been telling me to fast for a while, but I didn't listen because I was too attached to my body. I was like, no way am I. Extreme fasting. This is what he was telling me to do. And it was before it was like a thing. And I finally did, I finally did do it um, out of curiosity, but I wanted information to support my journey. And so I was reading books on fasting, not there too, too many of them didn't really weren't around, but now a lot of them are coming around. A lot of more science is coming out to fasting, but I wanted spiritual, I wanted spiritual guidance with regard to fasting. And I was tired of, I read so much Eastern stuff, you know, you know, Taoism, Buddhism, Hinduism, I read a lot of stuff. I was like, now I want something uniquely Western. And I found the Orthodox Christian church. I found the, or, not the church itself, but the writings of the fathers, the Orthodox writings. And I was like, these dudes, they fast sometimes up to like 300, uh, uh, 200 days a year. They were fat. And there was an entire books written on fasting. One book I, I discovered called the Philokalia, which is, uh, which is uh, writings of the, of the early fathers, like first, second, third century uh, Christians. And uh, I was like, wow, there's a treasure trove of, of wisdom written from early, like old school Christians. I know you mentioned like T.D. Jakes and stuff like that. That's cool. 
I'm just, I don't dig most contemporary stuff. Like I, I find my, my greatest love in old writings. It's just me. And so I started reading like writings of the desert fathers, these guys who would like go out into the desert and live as hermits. Uh, I, I really want, I started to under, try, I started to be fascinated with um, monastic living, monasticism, asceticism. I dug deep into asceticism and this was all, you know, out of curiosity, but the more I read those writings, the more I realized that Christianity is far deeper, so much deeper than I was led to believe in the West because it has been so watered down, so feminized, so bastardized. Christianity is, is, a, uh, is a shell of what these men experienced. I mean, it was a, they called it the way. It was a living experience. It was, it was, it was a living philosophy. Everything, every breath they, they took in was this focus on transcending, denying the self and carrying their cross. And I was just, I was just astonished by their stuff. And, but it didn't really change much in my, it didn't change me much. I just thought it was great stuff and I was fasting. And throughout that time also, something that was unique to me is that I started smoking weed at, at age 35. I never smoked weed before in my life. Age 35, when I started, you know, things started getting a little weird for me in my life. I, I said, well, I'm actually smoking weed. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I smoked it. And I smoked it for five years. So it's been about a, a little over a year, year and a half that I realized, man, I'm hooked on this stuff. I'm smoking like every day and I can't quit. And this was around the time I was fasting and I was reading uh, the writings of the fathers. And I had a moment and I was high. So I don't know if it was God talking to me or what, but I had a moment and I was high and, and I started having this conversation with God. And I was like, I can't quit this. I'm not strong enough. I'm a strong man. I've done everything with my will. I've built my business and my family, I did all this thing. I think that I did it myself. I got a strong will. I'm a fighter and I can't stop smoking weed. So guess what, God, take it away from me. I'm not gonna quit. In fact, I'm gonna smoke tomorrow. I'm gonna keep going until you take it away from me, right? Because that's what the, the writings will say, you know, rest on the father, trust in the father. There's a lot of uh, writings back then. They would write a lot about spiritual warfare and demonic attacks. I was like, if you're, if you're stronger than these demons, then you take it away from me. Well, it wasn't but a week later, he took it away from me. <laughs> wow. In a moment, uh, and that was it. That was it, he took it away from me in a moment. And at the same time, he said, look, cause he showed me why he showed, that's when he was showing me my sins. And he said, you gotta go and confess your sins. You gotta go, you gotta repent, you gotta turn around. This is your moment, this is your chance. I've taken this away from you, but you owe me this. And um, I didn't know what to do. I was like, well, I don't go to church. I don't know what, you know what's going on. Well, it turns out that I, and this is when I sensed the Lord speaking in my life. He said, you were baptized. You were baptized as a baby. You were confirmed and you're a Catholic. I'm like, wait, what are you talking about? I haven't gone to Catholic church since I was like nine years old. He's like, confess your sins, go. And I had to go Google, I had to Google up where is the church. And then uh, I went, I didn't know what I was doing. I haven't gone to confession since like my first confession, which was my last confession. I was like 10 years old. And um, through that, he introduced me back into the sacraments that gave me training wheels, I like to say an opportunity, you know, when I do something I need it every day. And one of the things that I didn't choose Catholicism, I didn't choose it. God told me that's what you are, this is where you go. And I'm happy that he did because what I needed was daily communion with God. It wasn't like I could go on Sundays. I wasn't gonna be a Sunday Catholic, a Sunday uh, Christian. Uh, I wasn't gonna study the word and read the Bible and try to figure it out like a lot of Protestants do. I needed to go every day to daily mass, you know, and I went to, I went to mass every day. This is how I, you know, I, I kicked the habit and changed my life. Uh, I go to mass every day and here I am, you know, a little over a year later, I'm not addicted to weed anymore. Uh, and I am transformed. I'm transformed and I'm, I'm learning to understand. I don't understand. I don't know anything about Christianity. I really didn't. 
Mm. Like you said, you, 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 you mentioned that as well. I was like, I don't know what that meant. I don't know what any of these things mean. Um, but my, my heart was transformed and God gave me a path. And here I am on this path and it's unfolding. And I just recognize every day as a, it's a sanctifying process. I'm getting, you know, I'm saved in the blood. Jesus was a sacrifice, the final sacrifice, the blood sacrifice. Understand, I had to understand why too. I didn't understand why Jesus had to sacrifice himself for us. I didn't realize how much interplay there was in our ancient worlds with, uh, with, cult rituals and uh, uh, spiritual rituals. You say today that, you know, that there needs to be everything. And there's a sacrifice. I know that because I'm a strength coach where well, you got to sacrifice if you're going to get stronger. I recognize that that's a principle in life. There's a sacrifice for everything. Mm-hmm. And God would, God asked Israel to, to sacrifice. But all the, all the demons were asking their pay, all the pagan gods, which I call demons and fallen angels, or asking their people to sacrifice. They were doing all kinds of baby sacrifices. If you look at like the, uh, the Mayan temples and they were doing human sacrifice. It was all, human sacrifice was not anything strange. Was, yeah, we kill. We, and, to, and to this day, to this day, we, there's human sacrifice going on all around the world. I, in fact, Planned Parenthood is an institution designed for baby sacrifice. If you look at the, 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 the Planned Parenthood building, it looks like one of those Mayan temples. It is a blood sacrifice. The, the globalists or the uh, those who want to depopulate the planet, they have they have sacrificial they have sacrificial ceremonies all the time. Every time there's bombs being blasted and dropped, they look at like look at uh, Syria. The whole thing was a sacrifice. 9/11 was a sacrifice. There were blood sacrifices. The 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 Satanists and the Luciferians are they're doing sacrifices all the time. I had to understand sacrifice and its history and where it's coming from and realize that the blood of Christ was the final sacrifice for all my sins. No more guilt, no more shame, no more trying to do it, trying to make it happen, no more trying to be the strongest version of myself, no more having to prove myself. God took all that away in that moment and said, boom, now it's done. Guess what? Turn away from yourself and carry your cross. And that's it. I love that. I love that turn because now I can mortify the flesh. <laughs> I get, and I love mortifying my flesh because I'm a strong man. I'm a masochist. I love beating myself up. I can mortify my flesh and offer it as penance to God. And I can carry his cross. And what was his cross? Suffering and sacrifice. I like that. You know, there's the whole... Jesus is your friend. Jesus is going to come and change, make your life better. Yeah, there is that. But what does he ask us to do for that? Pick up this cross and carry it. Dude. I read yeah. the rosary I, every day. I do the rosary every day also. There's the, there's the, 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 the five um, decades that are associated with his suffering. And when, you, when I think every single day about his agony in the garden, right? What is he, he's showing an example for us. His agony in the garden, his, uh, the scourging, whooping his body and they put the crown of thorns on him. Then they give him this cross to carry, just drag this cross. Then he nailed it, he didn't just, he didn't just die, he suffered. That's the example. And that's the way we're meant to live sacrifice yeah. um, we make ourselves a living sacrifice man i don't think we could find a better place to end it than right there seriously <laughs> i i literally did a uh, just a post on instagram the other day about carrying your cross i was actually talking about carl lentz the carl lentz situation and i could i related to him because i'm like he I'm imagining that he was carrying his cross and he just got tired of the weight of it. And he, he had some secret sin. He had some girl on the side. He was pretending to be somebody he wasn't. And he just wanted to set his cross down for a minute because he was like tired. And so I could, I was talking about that, but sometimes, I mean, that's what it is. 100%. It's all about that. It's about, you know, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. So it's always, it, that's it, man. It's about, it's about bearing that cross and dying to your flesh. But man, I, I'm so grateful that you gave me some time. Um, I know you're you're very sought after. You know, a lot of people probably want to talk to you and interview you. I, I'm grateful that you allowed me to pick your brain. Is there anything you guys you want to talk about or any 
programs. How can people connect with you? I guess let's just start there. Instagram, the best place. Yeah, probably. If you want to follow me, that's where I'm most active. If you could even call it that, but yep. You'll see my ads on Instagram. If you sign up for <laughs> sign up for my page. Awesome. Yep. If you see an ad, click it and go and buy and join me because you won't be disappointed. Well, thanks again for coming on, man. I'm, I'm grateful uh, for your time. Look forward to spending eternity in heaven with you. Because well, I think we're both going to be there. <laughs> I don't want to make any assumptions. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, not because of, certainly not because of me, but because of, uh, <laughs> because of Jesus, I'll be there. Yeah, man. So anyway, appreciate it. Thank you, Elliot. You got it, Rob. It was a great time speaking with you, buddy. Okay. That's it for episode 31 of Kowalski Analysis. Uh, just a reminder, register for Seize the Day. Go to cityfam.com under the events tab and secure your spot. And I will see you all next week. Have a good night.